Welcome to an evening of spooky, shivery, spine-tingling horror with the strollers. My name is Emma Terry, and I'll be your ghost. <laughs> I mean your host for tonight's petrifying program. Our first piece is from that master of Gothic American horror, Edgar Allan Poe. The Telltale Heart is one of Poe's most famous works, and it just might have you questioning your sanity. Mom, have you seen my strict nine? I know I do every day. Detrimenta. Be a good ghoul and feed the Audrey too. Here, partial to this particular cut of meat. Whatever. And now, the strollers are proud to present the Telltale Heart. True. Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses. Not destroyed. Not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily. How calmly I tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. But once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man. And thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now, this is the point you fancy me mad. Mad men know nothing, but you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch on his door and opened it, oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern all closed, all closed that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly. And so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening, so far that I could see him as he lay on his bed. <laughs> Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well within the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously. Cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Mm. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. 
Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think, there I was, opening the door, little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed, suddenly as if startled. Now you may think I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch, with a thick darkness, for the shutters were fastened through fear of robbers, and so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing on it steadily, steadily. I had my head in, and was about to open the lantern. When my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening. Just as I have done night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief, oh no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew that sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept. It has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him. Although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise, when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been growing ever since upon him. He had been uh, trying to fancy them causeless. But could not. He had been saying to himself, it is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor. Or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. <laughs> yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he found all in vain. All in vain, because death in approaching him had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, Without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a simple dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot out from the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinction. All a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray, as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of the sense? Now I say there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. But I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury, as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained, and I kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, so I am. 
And now, at the dead hour of night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet, for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart must burst. And now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once. Only once. In an instant, I had dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him, and then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, did how, this however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon his heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If still you think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out. No stain of any kind. No blood spot whatever. I had been far too wary for that. A tub had caught all. <laughs> when I had made an end to these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered two people. Who introduced themselves? With perfect suavity. As officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office. And they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the officers welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own, in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues. Uh, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them I was singularly at ease. They sat. And while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat. And still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling. But it continued and gained definiteness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale. But I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice. Yet the sound increased. What could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath. And yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently. But the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key and with violent gesticulations. But the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the officers. But the, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, 
What could I do? I foamed. I raved. I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the officers chatted pleasantly. And smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty oh, God, no. No, they heard. They suspected. They knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, louder, louder. Villains! I shrieked. Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the plank. Here, here. It is the beating of his hideous heart. Deck the halls with poison ivy. Da -da 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 -da. Ah, good to see you haven't been scared away by that dreadful tale of madness and murder. I've even learned something. Always hide the bodies in the garage and not under the floorboards. For our next piece, we bring to you a perfect example of be careful what you wish for. Myself, I wish I had a new machete, but wrong holiday. We present to you the twisted tale of the monkey's paw by English author W.W. Jacobs. Outside, the night was cold and wet, but in the small parlor of Laburnum Villa, the blinds were drawn and the fire burned brightly. Father and son were at chess. The former, who possessed ideas about the game involving radical changes, put his king into such sharp and unnecessary peril that it even provoked comment from the white-haired old lady knitting placidly by the fire. Hear that wind. Mr. White has seen a fatal mistake of his own doing and is attempting to distract his son in order to keep him from noticing. I'm listening. Check. I hardly think he'll come tonight. Mate. That's the worst of living out so far out. Of all the beastly, slushy, out of the way places to live in, this is the worst. Pathways a bog and the roads a torrent. I don't know what people are thinking about. I suppose because only two houses oh. on the road are occupied, they think it doesn't matter. Never mind, dear. Perhaps you'll win the next one. <laughs> Mr. White looks up sharply, just in time to intercept a knowing glance between mother and son. The words die away on his lips and he hides a guilty grin. The gate bangs loudly and heavy footsteps approach. There he is. Mr. White rises quickly, opens the door, and condoles with the newly arrived Sergeant Major Morris. The sergeant also condoles himself, causing Mrs. White to tut tut. <laughs> As her husband enters the room, followed by the Sergeant Major. Sergeant Major Morris. The Sergeant Major nods all around and takes the proffered seat by the fire watching contentedly while his host gets out whiskey and tumbling. At the third glass of whiskey, the sergeant made his eyes got brighter. He began to talk. The little family circle regarded with eager interest this visitor from distant parts as he stared with broad shoulders in the chair and spoke of wild scenes and doughty deeds of wars and plagues and strange peoples. 21 years of it. When he went away, he was just a slip of a youth in the warehouse. Yeah. Now look at him. He doesn't seem to have taken much harm. I'd like to go to India myself, just to look around a bit, you know. Better off where you are. 
Oh, I should, should like to see those old temples and fakirs and jugglers. What was that you started telling me about the other day about a monkey's paw or something, Morris? Uh, nothing. <laughs> Leastways, nothing worth hearing. Monkey's paw? Oh, well, it's just a bit of what you might call magic, perhaps. His three listeners lean forward eagerly. The visitor absentmindedly puts his empty glass to his lips and then sets it down again. His host refills it for him. To look at it, it's just a little ordinary paw dried to a mummy. He takes something out of his pocket and proffers it. Mrs. White draws back with a grimace. But Herbert takes it and examines it curiously. Then Mr. White takes the paw from Herbert, examines it, and places it on the table. And what exactly is special about it? It had a spell put on it by an old fakir, a very holy man. He wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives and that those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow. He put a spell on it so that three separate men could each have three wishes from it. <laughs> the three family members laughed lightly, but it seems out of place as the Sergeant Major is very serious. Well, why don't you have three, sir? Sergeant Major regards Herbert in the way that middle age is wont to regard presumptuous youth. I have. And did you really have three wishes granted? I did. And has anybody else wished? The first man had his three wishes, so yes. I don't know what the first two were, but the third was for death. That's how I got the paw. If you've had your three wishes, Morris, uh, it's no good to you now. What do you keep it for? Fancy, I suppose. I did have some idea of selling it, but I don't think I will. It has caused enough mischief already. Besides, people won't buy. They think it's a fairy tale, some of them, and those who do think anything of it want to try it first and pay me afterwards. If you could have another three wishes, would you have them? I don't know. I don't know. The sergeant picks up the paw between his thumb and forefinger, dangles it momentarily, and suddenly throws it upon the fire. Mr. White, with a slight cry, stoops down and snatches it off. Better let it burn. Well, if you don't want it, Morris, give it to me. I won't. I threw it on the fire. If you keep it, don't blame me for what happens. Pitch it on the fire again like a sensible man. Mr. White shakes his head and examines it closely. But how do you do it? Hold it up in your right hand and wish aloud, but I warn you of the consequences. Well, it sounds to me like the Arabian Nights. Uh, perhaps you could wish for uh, four pairs of hands for me. <laughs> <laughs> the Sergeant Major, with a look of alarm on his face, catches him by the arm. If you must wish, wish for something sensible. Mr. White drops it back in his pocket and placing chairs motions his friend to the table. In the business of supper, the talisman was partly forgotten, and afterward the three sat listening in an enthralled fashion to a second installment of the soldier's adventures in India. Afterwards, the sergeant major begged his leave as he had to catch the last train of the evening. The tale about the monkey's paw is not more truthful than those he has been telling us. We won't make much of it. Did you give him anything for it, dear? Rifle. <laughs> he didn't want it, but I made him take it and he pressed me again to throw it away. Likely? Why, we're going to be rich and famous and, and happy. Father, <laughs> wish to be an emperor to begin with, and you can't be henpecked. Oh, 
If your wife pulls the pot out again and eyes it dubiously. I don't know what to wish for. It, it, that's a fact. It seems to me I've got all I want. If you could pay off the house, you'd be quite happy, wouldn't you? Well, wish for 2,000 pounds then. That'll just do it. Herbert sits down at the piano and strikes a few chords with a solemn face, which is somewhat marred by a wink at his mother. I wish for 2,000 pounds. The paw is now on the ground. His wife and son run toward him. It moved. As I wished, it twisted in my hand like a snake. Well, I don't see the money, and I bet I never shall. Must have been your imagination, dear. <laughs> never mind, though. There's no harm done. But, but it gave me a shot all the same. The little family sat down by the fire again while the two men finished their pipes. Outside, the wind was higher than ever, and the old man started nervously at the sound of a door banging upstairs. A silence unusual and depressing settled upon all three, which lasted until the old couple rose to retire for the night. Herbert signals goodnight as his parents go off to bed. I expect you'll find the cash tied up in a big bag in the middle of your bed and something horrible watching you on top of the wardrobe, watching you as you pocket your ill-gotten gains. He sat alone in the darkness, gazing at the dying fire and seeing faces in it. The last face was so horrible and so simian that he gazed at it in amazement. It got so vivid that with a little uneasy laugh, he felt on the table for a glass containing a little water to throw over it. His hand grasped the monkey's paw, and with a little shiver, he wiped his hand on his coat and went up to bed. In the brightness of the wintry sun next morning, as it streamed over the breakfast table, he laughed at his fears. There was an air of prosaic wholesomeness about the room, which it had lacked on the previous night, and the dirty, shriveled little paw was pitched on the sideboard with a carelessness which betokened no great belief in its virtues. I suppose all old soldiers are the same. Imagine us listening to such nonsense. How could wishes be granted in these days? And even if they could, how would 2,000 pounds harm us? I'd drop on his head from the sky. <laughs> the more said things happen so naturally that you might, if you so wish, be able to attribute it to coincidence. Well, don't break into the money before I come back. I'm afraid it'll turn you into a mean, avaricious man and we'll have to disown you. <laughs> Herbert leaves. His mother laughed and following him to the door, watched him down the road and returning to the breakfast table was very happy at the expense of her husband's credulity, all of which did not prevent her from scurrying to the door at the postman's knock, nor prevent her from referring somewhat shortly to retired Sergeant Majors of alcoholic tendencies when she found that the post brought a tailor's bill. Later that evening, the two sat down to dinner and Mr. White poured himself a beer. I am guessing that Herbert will be making more of his funny remarks when he comes home. <laughs> I dare say he will. But for all that, that thing moved in my hand and that well, you swear to. You thought it did. I say it did. There was no thought about it. I had, I had just, what's the matter? His wife made no reply. She was watching the mysterious movements of a man outside who peering in an undecided fashion at the house appeared to be trying to make up his mind to enter. In mental connection with the 2000 pounds, she noticed that the stranger was well-dressed and wore a silk hat of glossy newness. Three times he paused at the gate and then walked on again. The fourth time he stood with his hand upon it and then with sudden resolution flung it open and walked up the path. Mrs. White at the same moment placed her hands behind her and hurriedly unfastening the strings of her apron put that useful article of apparel beneath the cushion of her chair. 
She brought the stranger, who seemed ill at ease, into the room. He gazed at her furtively and listened in a preoccupied fashion as the old lady apologized for the appearance of the room and her husband's coat, a garment that he usually reserved for the garden. She then waited as patiently as she possibly could for him to broach his business, but he was at first strangely silent. I, uh, I was asked to call. Uh, I come from Ma and Megan's. Has something happened? Has something happened to Herbert? What is it? What is it? Now, there, there, mother. Uh, sit down. Don't jump to conclusions. You've not brought bad news, sir. I I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sorry. Is he hurt? Badly hurt. But he is not in any pain. Oh, thank God for that. Thank God. He broke off suddenly as the sinister meaning of the assurance dawned upon her, and she saw the awful confirmation of her fears in the other's averted face. She caught her breath, and turning to her slower-witted husband, laid her trembling old hand upon his. There was a long silence. He was caught in the machinery. Machinery, yes. Mr. White sits staring blankly out of the window. He takes his wife's hand in his. He was the only one left to us. It is hard. The lawyer coughs and rises, walking slowly to the window. He does not turn to them when he speaks. The firm wished me to convey their sincere sympathy with you in your great loss, I, I beg that you will understand I am only their servant and merely ordering, following their orders. Both parents are in total quiet shock. Uh, I was to say that Ma and Megan's disclaim all responsibility and they admit no liability at all. But in consideration of your son's services, they wish to present you with a certain sum as compensation. Mr. White drops his wife's hand and rises to his feet, gazing at the lawyer with a look of horror. How much? Two thousand pounds. <laughs> Unconscious of his wife's shriek, the old man smiled faintly put out his hands like a sightless man and dropped a senseless heap to the floor. In the huge new cemetery, some two miles distant, the old people buried their dead and came back to a house steeped in shadow and silence. It was all over so quickly that at first they could hardly realize it and remained in a state of expectation as though of something else to happen, something else which was to lighten this load too heavy for old hearts to bear. But the days passed and expectation gave place to resignation. The hopeless resignation of the old, sometimes miscalled apathy. Sometimes they hardly exchanged a word, for now they had nothing to talk about, and their days were long to weariness. It was about a week after that that the old man, waking suddenly in the night, stretched out his hand and found himself alone. The room was in darkness, and the sound of subdued weeping came from the window. He raised himself in bed and listened. Back, you'll be cold. It is colder for my son. The sound of her sobs died away on his ears. The bed was warm and his eyes heavy with sleep. He dozed fitfully and then slept until a sudden wild cry from his wife awoke him with a start. The paw! The monkey's paw! Where? Where is it? What's the matter? I, I, I want it. You haven't destroyed it. Why? Oh, I, I, I only just thought of it. Why didn't I think of it before? Why didn't you think of it before? Think of what? The other two wishes. We've only had one. Was not that enough? No. No, we'll have one more. Go down and get it quickly and wish my son alive. Oh, God, you are mad. Get 
it! Get it quickly and wish! Oh, my boy, my boy! Oh, get back to bed. You don't know what you're saying. We've had the first wish granted. Why not the second? A, a coincidence! No, no! Go, go get it! Go get it and wish! He has been dead for ten days, and besides me, well, I would not tell you this otherwise, but I only recognized him from his clothing. If he was too terrible for you to see then, how now? Bring him back. Do you think I fear the babe I, I nursed? He went down in the darkness and felt his way to the parlor and then to the mantelpiece. The talisman was in its place and a horrible fear that the unspoken wish might bring his mutilated son before him ere he could escape from the room seized upon him and he caught his breath as he found that he had lost the direction of the door. His brow cold with sweat, he felt his way around the table, groped along the wall until he found himself in the small passage with the unwholesome thing in his hand. Even his wife's face seemed changed as he entered the room. It was white and expectant, and to his fears seemed to have an unnatural look upon it. He was afraid of her. Wish. Foolish and wicked. Wish. I wish my son alive again. Uh, oh. The talisman fell to the floor and he regarded it fearfully. Then he sank trembling into a chair as the old woman with burning eyes walked to the window and raised the blind. He sat until he was chilled with the cold, glancing occasionally at the figure of the old woman peering through the window. The candle end, which had burned below the rim of the china candlestick, was throwing pulsating shadows on the ceiling and walls until with a flicker larger than the rest it expired. The old man, with an unspeakable sense of relief at the failure of the talisman, crept back to his bed. And a minute or two afterward, the old woman came silently and apathetically beside him. Neither spoke, but lay silently listening to the ticking of the clock. A stair creaked, and a squeaky mouse scurried noisily through the wall. The darkness was oppressive. And after lying for some time, screwing up his courage, he took the box of matches and striking one, went downstairs for a candle. At the foot of the stairs, the match went out and he paused to strike another. And at the same moment, a knock, so quiet and stealthy as to be scarcely audible, sounded on the front door. The matches fell from his hand and spilled in the passage. He stood motionless, his breath suspended until the knock was repeated. Then he turned and fled swiftly back to his room and closed the door behind him. A third knock sounded through the house. What's that? Uh, a rat, a rat, it, it passed me on the stairs. It's Herbert, it's Herbert. She runs to the door, but her husband runs in front of her, preventing her from answering. What are you going to do? It's my boy, it's Herbert. I, I forgot it was two miles away. What are you doing holding me back? Let me go, I must open the door. For God's sakes, don't let it in. You're afraid of your own son? Oh, let me go, I'm coming. Herbert, I'm coming, I'm coming. There was another knock and another. The old woman with a sudden wrench broke free and ran from the room. Her husband followed to the landing and called after her appealingly as she hurried downstairs. He heard the chain rattle back and the bottom bolt drawn slowly and stiffly from the socket. Then the old woman's voice, strained and panting. The bolt, come down here, I, I can't reach it. But her husband was on his hands and knees, groping wildly on the floor in search of the paw. If he could only find it before the thing outside got in. A perfect fusillade of knocks reverberated through the house and he heard the scraping of a chair as his wife put it down in the passage against the door. He heard the creaking of the bolt as it came slowly back 
and at the same moment he found the monkey's paw and frantically breathed his third and last wish. The knocking ceased suddenly, although the echoes of it were still in the house. He heard the chair drawn back and the door opened. A cold wind rushed up the staircase and a long, loud wail of disappointment and misery from his wife. Oh, no! Gave him courage to run down to her side and then to the gate beyond. The street lamp flickering opposite shone on a quiet and deserted road. Alas, poor Yorick. Well, not that poor, surely. This is at least 18 karat gold. Ah, welcome back. Wasn't that a gruesome tale? And just think of the pausabilities of three wishes. <sighs> so delightful. Shall we go on? We have now, for your grim enjoyment, a haunting poem, sure to bewitch your shriveled minds and hearts. The Night Wind by Eugene Field. <laughs> the wind go you tis a pitiful sound to hear it seems to chill you through and through with a strange and speechless fear tis the voice of the night that broods outside when folks should be asleep and many a many is a time i've cried to the darkness brooding far and wide over the land and the deep whom do you want O oh lonely night that you wear the long hours through and the night would say, in its ghostly way, you, you, you. My mother told me long ago, with eye and nightgown clad, oh. that when the night went wailing so, somebody had been bad. And then when I was snug in bed, whither I had been sent, with the blankets pulled up around my head, I think of what my mother said and wonder what child she meant. And who's been bad today? I'd ask of the wind the hoarsely blew. And the voice would say in its meaningful way, you, you, you. That this was true, I must allow. You'll not believe it though. Yes, though I'm quite the model now. I was not always so. And if you doubt what things I say, suppose you make the test. Suppose when you've been bad someday and up to bed are sent away from mother and the rest. Suppose you ask, who has been bad? And then you'll hear what's true. For the wind will moan in its ruefulest tone. You, you. You! What a gripping poem. Like a pair of skeletal hands grasping your shoulders from behind. Nothing like a sip of fine sherry on a crisp October evening. Maybe you've heard of this particular variety, Amontillado. For our next piece, we return to the macabre world of Edgar Allan Poe. Poe spins a thrilling tale about a man whose business is revenge and business is booming. Raise a glass to the cask of Amontillado. <laughs> A thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best as I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You who so well know the nature of my soul will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length, I would be avenged. This was a point definitively settled, but the very 
definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato. Although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared, he prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. <laughs> Few Italians have the true virtuoso spirit. For the most part, their enthusiasm is adopted to suit the time and opportunity to, to, to practice imposture upon the British and Austrian millionaires. In painting and gemmery, Fortunato, like his countrymen, was a quack. But in the matter of old wines, he was sincere. In this respect, I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk one evening, during the supreme madness of the carnival season that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for, for he'd been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight-fitting party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never stop wringing his hand. My, my dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How how remarkably well you are looking today. But I have received a pipe of what passes for Montelado, and I have my doubts. How? A Montelado? A pipe? Impossible! And in the middle of the carnival. I have my doubts, and I was silly enough to pay the full Montelado price without consulting you in the matter. But you were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. A Montelado? Ah, I, I have my doubts. A Montelado? And I must satisfy them. A Montelado? As you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchese. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me... Lucchese cannot tell a Montelado from Sherry. <laughs> and yet, some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let's go. Whither? To your vaults. My friend, no, I, I, I will not impose upon... Your good nature, I perceive you have an engagement. Uh, Lucchese... I have no engagement. Come! Uh, my friend, no, it, it is not the engagement, but the severe coal with which I perceive you are afflicted. The, the vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. But the lotto... <laughs> You have been imposed upon. And as for Lucchese, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. <laughs> Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm, putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a roucolea closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They, they had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I had told them that I should not return until the morning and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, <laughs> to ensure their immediate disappearance one and all as soon as my back was turned. 
the gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. It is farther on, but observe the white webwork which gleams from these cavern walls. Oh, nighter. Uh, nighter. Uh, how long have you had that cough? <laughs> My poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It is nothing. Uh, come, we will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy as once I was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchese and... E enough. Uh, the cough is mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True, true, and indeed, uh, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, but you should use all proper caution. Uh, a draught of this Medoc will defend us from the damps. Drink. drink. I drink to the buried that repose around us. And I, to your long life. These vaults are extensive. The Montresors were a great and numerous family. I, I forget your arms. A huge human foot d'or in a field azure, the, the foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo me impune la cassette. Good. The wine sparkled in his eyes, and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the Medoc. We had passed through walls of piled bones with casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The, the niter, see, it increases. It hangs like moss upon the vault. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back ere it is too late. Your cough. It is nothing. Let us go on. But first, another draught of Medoc. <laughs> You do not comprehend? Uh, no, not, not I. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You, you are not of the Masons. Oh, yes, 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 you, yes. You impossible. A Mason? A Mason. A, a sign, a sign. Uh, it is, it is this. You jest. But let us proceed to the Amontillado. Be it so. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and, and descending again arrived at a deep crypt in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau to... To, to glow rather than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt, there appeared another less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains piled to the vault overhead. In the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris, three sides of the interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth side, 
The bones had been thrown down and, and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived still interior recess, in depth about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no special use within itself, but formed merely the interval between the two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs, and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his torch, endeavored to pry into the depth of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light, did not enable us to see. Proceed. Herein is the amontillado. As for Lucchese... Ah, he is an ignoramus. Interrupted my friend as he stepped unsteadily forward while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant, he had reached the extremity of the niche and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more and I had him fettered to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other about two feet horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, and from the other a padlock. Throwing links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand over the wall. You cannot help feeling the nighter. It is indeed very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The amontillado? True. <laughs> the amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of the masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depth of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier and, and the third and then the fourth and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes during which that I might hearken to it with more satisfaction. I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, sixth, and seventh tier. The wall was nearly upon a level with my breast. I again paused, and holding the flambeau over the mason work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly from the throat of the chain form seemed to thrust me violently back. For a, free, uh, uh, for a brief moment, I, I hesitated, I trembled. Unsheathing my rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess. But the thought of an instant reassured me. I placed my hand upon the solid fabric of the catacombs and felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall. No! No! Not the sword, no! Much 
touch us all. No. Please help me. <laughs> Please help me. <laughs> It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I, I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out of the niche a, a, a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty in recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. <laughs> a very good joke, indeed, and excellent jest. We shall have many a rich laugh about it at the palazzo <laughs> over our wine. <laughs> The Amontillado. <laughs> yes, the Amontillado. But is it not getting late? Will will not they be awaiting us at the Palazzo, the Lady Fortunato, and the rest? Let us be gone. <laughs> yes, let us be gone. For the love of God, Montezor! Yes, for the love of God. But to these words, I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud. Fortunato! No answer. I called again. Fortunato! No answer still. I, I, I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came reply only a jinging of the bells. My heart grew sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace requi escat. Look, not a single broken bone. Oh, better luck next time, dear. Oh, I just love vengeance, don't you? Such an exquisite taste and so many flavors to choose from. Well, onwards we go to another American classic about a rural school teacher who encounters something even more frightening than a room full of school children. Here now is an excerpt from Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. time of night, that schoolmaster, Ichabod Crane, jilted, heavy-hearted, and crestfallen, pursued his travels homewards along the sides of the lofty hills which rise above Tarrytown, and which he had traversed so cheerily in the afternoon. The hour was as dismal as himself. Far below him, the Tappan Zee spread its dusky and indistinct waste of waters, with here and there the tall mast of a sloop, riding quietly at anchor under the land. In the dead hush of midnight, he could even hear the barking of the watchdog from the opposite shore of the Hudson. But it was so vague and faint as to only give an idea of his distance from this faithful companion of men. Now and then, too, the long drawn crowing of a cock, accidentally awakened, would sound far, far off from some farmhouse away among the hills. 
but it was like a, a dreaming sound in his ear. No signs of life occurred near him, but occasionally the melancholy chirp of a cricket. Or perhaps the guttural twang of a bullfrog from a neighboring marsh as if sleeping uncomfortably and turning suddenly in his bed. All the stories of ghosts and goblins that he had heard in the afternoon now came crowding upon his recollection. The nights grew darker and darker, and the stars seemed to sink deeper into the sky, and driving clouds occasionally hid them from his sight. He had never felt so lonely and dismal. He was, moreover, approaching the very place where many of the scenes of the ghost stories had been laid. In the center of the road stood an enormous tulip tree, which towered like a giant above all the other trees of the neighborhood and formed a kind of landmark. Its limbs were gnarled and fantastic, large enough to form trunks for ordinary trees, twisting down almost to the earth and rising again into the air. It was connected with the tragical story of the unfortunate Andre, who had been taken prisoner hard by and was universally known by the name of Major Andre's tree. Now the common people regarded it with a mixture of respect and superstition, partly out of sympathy for the fate of his ill-starred namesake, and partly for the tales of strange sights and doleful lamentations told concerning it. As Ichabod approached the fearful tree, he began to whistle. He thought the whistle was answered. It was but a blast sweeping sharply through the dry branches. But as he approached a little nearer, he thought he saw something white hanging in the midst of the tree. He paused and, and ceased whistling. But on looking more narrowly, perceived that it was a place where the tree had been scathed by lightning and the white wood lay bare. Suddenly he heard a groan, his teeth chattered, and his knees smote against the settle. But it was only the rubbing of one of the huge bow upon another as they were swayed about by the breeze. He passed the tree in safety. But new perils lay before him. About 200 yards from the tree, a small brook crossed the road and ran into a marshy and thickly wooded glen known by the name of Wiley's Swamp. A few rough logs laid side by side served as a bridge over this stream. Now on that side of the road where the brook entered the wood, a group of oaks and chestnuts matted thick with wild grapevines threw a cavernous gloom over it. To pass this tree was the severest trial. It was at this identical spot that the unfortunate Andre was captured and under the covert of those chestnuts and vines were the sturdy yeoman concealed who surprised him. This has ever since been considered a haunted stream. And fearful are the feelings of the schoolboy who had to pass it alone after dark. As he approached the stream, his heart began to thump. He summoned up, however, all of his resolution, gave his horse a half half score of kick in the ribs, and attempted to brash, dash briskly across the bridge. But instead of startling forward, the perverse old Hammond made a lateral movement and ran broadside against the fence. Ichabod, whose fears increased the delay, jerked on the reins on the other side and kicked lustily with a contrary foot. It was all in vain. His steed started, it is true, but it was only to plunge to the opposite side of the road into a thicket of brambles and alder bushes. But the schoolmaster now bestowed both whip and heel in the startling ribs of old gunpowder, who dashed forward, snuffling and snorting. He came to a stand by the bridge with a suddenness that had nearly sent his rider sprawling over his head. Just at the moment, a plushy tramp by the side of the bridge caught the sensitive ear of Ichabod. In the dark shadow of the grove on the margin of the brook, he beheld something huge, misshapen and towering. It stirred not, but it seemed gathered up in the gloom like some gigantic monster ready to spring upon the traveler. Oh, the hair of the affrighted pedagogue rose upon his head with terror. What was to be done? 
to turn and fly now was too late. And besides, what chance was there of escaping ghosts of goblins, if such it was, I mean, which could ride upon the, the wings of the wind? Summoning up, therefore, a show of courage, he demanded, in stammering accents, Who, who are you? He received no reply. He repeated and still his demand in a still more agitated voice. And still there was no answer. Once more, he cudgeled the sides of the inflexible gunpowder and shutting his eyes broke forth with an involuntary fever went into a psalm tune. Just then the shadowy object of alarm put itself in motion and with a scramble and a bound stood at once in the middle of the road. Though the night was dark and dismal, yet the form of the unknown might now in some degree be ascertained. He appeared to be a horseman of large dimensions and mounted on a black horse of a powerful frame. He, he made no offer of molestation or sociability, but kept aloof on one side of the road. Ichabod, who had no relish for this strange midnight companion, and bethought himself of the ghost stories told earlier that day, now quickened his steed in hopes of leaving him behind. The stranger, however, quickened his horse to an equal pace. Ichabod pulled up and fell into a walk, thinking to lag behind. But the other did the same. His heart began to sink within him. He endeavored to resume his psalm tune, but the parched tongue clove to the roof of his mouth, and he could not utter a stave. There was something moody and dogged silence of this pertinacious companion that was mysterious and appalling. It was soon fearfully accounted for. On mounting a rising ground, which brought the figure of his fellow traveler in relief against the sky, gigantic in height and muffled in a cloak. Ichabod was horror-struck on perceiving that he was Endless. But his horror was still more increased on observing that the head, which should have rested on his shoulders, was carried before him on the pommel of his saddle. His terror rose to desperation. He rained a shower of kicks and blows upon gunpowder, hoping by a sudden movement to give the companion the slip. But the specter started full jump with him. Away, then, that they dashed through thick and thin. Stones flying and sparks flashing at every bound. Ichabod's flimsy garments fluttering in the air as he stretched his long, lanky body away over his horse's head in the eagerness of his flight. They had now reached the road which turns off to town, but Gunpowder, who seemed possessed with a demon, made an opposite turn <gasps> and plunged headlong downhill to the road that crosses the bridge, famous in the goblin story, and just beyond where stands a whitewashed church. Just as he got halfway through the hollow, the girths of the saddle gave away, and he felt it slipping from under him. He seized it by the pommel and endeavored to hold it firm, but in vain. And in just time to save himself by clasping old gunpowder around the neck when the saddle fell to the earth. <laughs> and he held it, he heard it trampled underfoot by the pursuer. He had much to do to maintain his seat, sometimes slipping on one side, sometimes on another, and sometimes jolted on the high ridge of the horse's backbone with a violence that he verily feared would cleave him asunder. An opening in the trees now cheered him with the hopes that the church bridge was at hand. He saw the walls of the church dimly glaring beyond the trees behind. If I can reach, but reach that bridge, thought it could buy, I, I am safe. Just then he heard the black steed panting and blowing close behind him. He even fancied that he felt his hot breath. Another convulsive kick in the ribs and old gunpowder sprang upon the bridge. He thundered over the resounding planks. He gained the opposite side and now it could buy cast a look, a look behind him to see if the pursuer should vanish according to goblin rule in a flash of fire and brimstone. Just then, he saw the goblin rising in the stirrups and in the very act of hurling his head at him. Ichabod endeavored to dodge the horrible missile, but too late, it encountered his cranium with a tremendous crash. And he was tumbled headlong into the dust and gunpowder, the black steed and the goblin rider passed by like a whirlwind. 
The next morning, the old horse was found without his saddle and with the bridle under his feet, soberly cropping the grass at his master's gate. Ichabod did not make his appearance at breakfast. Dinner hour came, but still no Ichabod. The boys assembled at the schoolhouse and strolled idly about the banks of the brook, but no schoolmaster. An inquiry was set on foot, and after diligent investigation, they came upon its traces. In one part of the road leading to the church was found the saddle trampled in the dirt, the tracks of horses' hooves deeply dented in the road, and evidently at furious speed, were traced to the bridge. Beyond which, on the bank of the brook, where the water ran deep and black, was found the hat of the unfortunate Ichabod. And close beside it, a shattered pumpkin such an exciting tale one wonders if it is indeed a legend or if it's a completely true story i know which i prefer and there's a lesson here <laughs> if life smashes your pumpkin make a pie well i'm afraid our time together is almost at an end I had so hoped to introduce you to my terrible twins, Israfel and Pazuzu, but alas, they are nowhere to be found. For our final piece, we bring you an unexpected tale from another American author of awful account, Ambrose Bierce. We present to you the grave tale of John Mortensen's funeral. John Mortensen was dead. His lines in the tragedy Man had all been spoken, and he had left the stage. The body rested in a fine mahogany coffin fitted with a plate of glass. All arrangements for the funeral had been so well attended to that had the deceased known, he would doubtless have approved. The face, as it's shown under the glass, was not disagreeable to look upon. It bore a faint smile. And as the death had been painless, had not been distorted beyond the repairing power of the undertaker. Hmm. At two o'clock of the afternoon, the friends were to assemble to pay their last tribute of respect. To one who had no further need of friends and respect. The surviving members of the family came severally every few minutes in the casket and what about the placid features beneath the glass? This did them no good. And it did no good for John Mortison. But in the presence of death, reason and philosophy are silent. As the hour of two approached, the friends began to arrive and after offering such constellation to the stricken relatives as the proprieties of the occasion required. They solemnly seated themselves about the room with an augmented consciousness of their importance in the scheme of things. Then the minister came and in that overshadowing presence, the lesser lights went into eclipse. His entrance was followed by that of the widow whose lamentations filled the room. She approached the casket and after leaning her face on the cold glass for a moment, was gently led to a seat near her daughter. Mournfully and low, the man of God began his eulogy of the dead and his doleful voice, mingled with the sobbing, which was its purpose to stimulate and sustain rose and fell, seemed to come and go like the sound of a sullen sea. 
The gloomy day grew darker as he spoke. A curtain of cloud underspread the sky, and a few drops of rain fell audibly. It seemed as if all nature were weeping for John Mortensen. When the minister had finished his eulogy with prayer, a hymn was sung, and the pallbearers took their places beside the bier. As the last notes of the hymn died away, the widow ran to the coffin and cast herself upon it, sobbing hysterically. <laughs> but gradually, however, she yielded to dissuasion, becoming more composed. And as the minister was in the act of leading her away, her eyes sought the face of the dead beneath the glass. <gasps> She threw up her arms and shrieked <laughs> Fell backward, insensible. The mourners sprang forward to the coffin. The friends followed. Uh, and as the clock on the mantel solemnly struck three, all were staring down upon the face of John Mortensen deceased. They turned away, sick and faint. One man trying in his terror to escape the awful sight, stumbled against the coffin so heavily as to knock away one of its frail supports. So the coffin fell to the floor. The glass was shattered by bits of the concussion. From the opening crawled John Mortensen's cat, which lazily leapt to the floor, sat up, tranquilly wiped its crimson muzzle with a forepaw, then walked with dignity from the room. What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? We hope you have enjoyed the stroller shot down Terra Lane. Thank you for coming and hope to haunt you again soon. <laughs>
Oh, 